So this is the, the last of a series that we're in called The Weight of Your Words. And uh, we're going to finish this up today. I've had some really good feedback about this series. A lot of people have really enjoyed it. I feel like it's equipped you guys on how to kind of communicate with each other, how to talk, you know, how to forgive, how to, how to do all these things that have to do with your words. And today is, is, is a really important day for me uh, because today is a day that I feel like I can actually equip you and give you something even more than the last two Sundays that can help you immediately or help you today. And I think that you guys, I mean, my heart, if you've been around here for a while, then you know this. My heart is for you. So you, I'm not preaching to the crowd right now. I'm speaking, I'm speaking to you. You guys matter to me. You're important to me. I have a burden for you. I think about you often. I pray for you often. Uh, every time I prepare for a Sunday morning, I always think, why does this matter to them? Why is this even important for them? And as I thought about this, I asked God to really open my heart up to maybe some of the things that people are going through, some of the things in the room, the experiences that people are having. And, and the thing that came to mind, and it goes well with the sermon, is that there's a, a whole bunch of us here that have some like relationships that maybe aren't in the best shape or aren't in the best order. And if you don't have relationships that are in bad shape, then what we have and what so many of us have is patterns that oftentimes lead us to relationships that are not in great shape or not in great order. And I feel like that if I could say anything today, that the things that I want to say to you are things that will help you to get some of your current relationships healed and in order and also stop the patterns that continue to put you into bad relationships, hurt relationships and the pattern just continues and continues and continues. So everything that I say this morning comes from a heart of love. And it comes from a hope that, that what we talk about this morning can help you. And especially those of you that are in a strained relationship right now, or that are dealing with strained relationships right now, then I hope that this helps you immediately. Because life is short. Life is too short for us to be upset with each other. Life is too short for our relationships to be not great. And so that's what we're doing today. Uh, we're talking about these three considerations that we take into account as we talk about uh, how we use our words and how the weight of our words impact each other. And just as a bit of a review, the first two of those considerations is, is this here. Number one is going to be that not all words weigh the same. And what I mean by a consideration is this is something for you to kind of think and for you to have in your thought and in your mind as you're talking with people. Uh, it's like we need to realize the impact that we have on other people with our words. So when we realize that not all words weigh the same, that helps us to make good decisions on the words that we say to people and the words that we don't say to people. And sometimes that can even help you to know that something you're not saying is something that you should say. And, and if you miss this, these two messages, you can go online, either our YouTube page or our website, southpointchurch.co.za, and it has links to all of this stuff. Then the second consideration was that our source determines the weight. So the source where that communication is coming from determines how heavy or how important all of those words mean. And probably my favorite phrase from last week was, the relationship that you have with somebody is different than the relationship that they have with you. And that has a lot to do with, with who's in authority, who has a position of power and in that relationship. But for us to recognize that our relationships with each other are not equally balanced and that that's okay, but it helps us to treat each other in a better way, I feel like. So th these are the first two considerations that we talked about. Now, Today, this was a, probably a little bit harder to unpack because I couldn't quite get the wording you know, the way that I wanted to. But today's third consideration is, is this here. And it's that, that there is no necessary correlation. That means the two words are connected between intent and outcome. There's no necessary correlation between intent and outcome. Uh, another way to look at this is, is this, is that intent is usually irrelevant. So let me explain to you what this means. Because what, what the word intent means here is, is what did you mean when you said something? What was it that you were trying to do or what was it that you were trying to get across? You know, to use the same word in the definition, 
What, what did you intend for it to mean or intend for uh, it, to, it to impact somebody in a certain way? So let me give you a physical example of this. If, um, so growing up, we had uh, a big wall kind of off the side of our house, and we used to always kick a soccer ball off of it or, or throw a basketball against it, and it was just this huge wall that was a retaining wall. And for us growing up, we had a big driveway, and so we could kick a ball against it, and that was what we did a lot. I'm sure our neighbors hated it because, you know, eight hours a day, it was just dunk, 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 dunk as we kicked that ball against it. And, um, yeah, one day uh, I kicked the ball, and for some reason I was kicking it at the garage because you had two garage doors, and in between the two garage doors was a brick wall attached to the house, and I used to like to try and, you know, hit that wall. Never mind the huge wall next to me. Why not aim for the tiny small wall? And so I, I kicked the ball, and I, I broke one of the garage windows, and I remember thinking, I'm, I'm actually going to die. My parents are going to kill me. Because I was young, and I, I thought you know, a broken window is, is punishable by death. And I remember my mom sending me to the room, to my room, and, uh, you know, for, hey, you're going to wait till your dad gets home. And me thinking, that this is it. Like, I'm dead. And I'm sitting upstairs flipping a coin. If it's heads, I die. If it's tails, they let me live, you know. And just trying to figure out, like, oh, man, this is such a big deal here. And the, the you know, and... To kind of give you closure on the story, I, I didn't really get in trouble. You know, that my parents didn't understand that it was an accident. But the point is, is that because it was an accident, it doesn't mean that the window refixed itself or that the window fixed itself. Yes, the window was broken. It was broken by accident. But it, it doesn't mean that, oh, well, I'm sorry, this was an accident. And so the window magically puts itself together. See, the, the intent was not to break the window. But the intent to not break the window did not impact the outcome, which is that the window broke anyway. So that's a physical example. Now, if we kind of transition that to an example within ourselves, our intent may not be that we say something that hurts somebody or that breaks somebody's feelings or that breaks somebody's self-confidence or, or breaks a relationship. It may be an accident. But that doesn't change the fact that something is still broken. And so because it's broken, just because it's an accident, it doesn't magically put itself back together. So that's what I mean by intent is irrelevant to the outcome. Is that no matter what your intentions are, the outcome still happens and broken things still happen. And just because it's an accident, it doesn't magically go back together. So what is it that we do? When we've said something that ends up hurting somebody or that ends up accidentally even breaking somebody. So th this is what we do. First thing that we do is, is we hurt and then after we hurt, we explain. So uh, th this is super practical. Don't, don't think too much into this here. When you hurt somebody's feelings, what's the first thing that oftentimes you want to do, especially if it's an accident? You want to say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way. Oh, you know what? Uh, you know, forgive me, that was an accident. I didn't know that you were listening. Um, you know, I was actually talking about, you know, another person named Jessica. Not you, Jessica. You know, I'm so sorry that you heard that there, but it was not about you. You know, so, so we've hurt somebody, and now we're trying to kind of e explain it away. We want them to understand that we didn't do it on purpose. We want them to understand that everything's okay. It's, it's, it's us trying to get them to understand it. Now, I know that every single one of us in the room do this here. So I, I want you to connect with this point. Oftentimes, when you hurt somebody, your spouse, your wife, your friend, your coworker, whoever it is, when you do it, our default action is to try and explain why it happened and to try and explain that hurt away, because that's the goal. If we can say, say something and make the hurt that they feel go away, then the whole thing goes away quickly, and that's a win. That's our goal. But it doesn't work that way, because the truth about explaining is this. It's that explaining is not the same. It's not equal to repairing. Put that, there you go. Explaining does not equal repairing. See, just because we explain something, it doesn't repair the relationship. We think that it does, but it actually does not. You know, I, I could explain to my mom how the window was broken, but that does not magically put the window back together. 
So as you sit here, you, you think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through this in, in so many different ways here, just over and over and over again. You've said or done something that's hurt somebody or hurt their feelings. It, it could be different from that. We're just going to stick with that as our example. You've said or done something that's hurt someone's feelings. Your default emotion, your default action is, I want to explain myself so that they're not hurt or so that I'm justified or so that this thing can go away and it can be dealt with and we can just move on. And the faster I do that, the better that it is. It's a win for all of us. So in order for this hurt to move or to grow or to repair or to get better, it means that I need to quickly explain something. But explaining does not repair. And what ends up happening is we get caught into this cycle and, and, and I've called it sort of, th- this is what explaining in action looks like. So th- this is you and your spouse. This is you and your friend, you and your coworker here. And I've got four points that they're going to put on the screen here. And, and this is explaining in action. This is what's happening when you're trying to repair what's been broken. Number one, first thing we do is we try to explain the hurt away. And again, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, I'm so sorry that that came out. I was talking about somebody else. Um, you have to understand that, that this was kind of an accident. Um, you know, please forgive me. I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. You know, I don't know why I, 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 I said what I said, but, you know, I, just trust me that I believe something else. We're, we're trying to explain the hurt away. Then we go to, we want to justify that it was not on purpose. Are, are you tracking with me? This is our default. This is what we do almost every single time. Hey, I didn't mean to hurt you. And then I... You need to understand here that let me justify that this is not on purpose. What can I tell you so that you know that I did not do this to you on on purpose? It was an accident. You know, I'm I'm sorry that it happened, but it was an accident. But then we expect from this immediate forgiveness. So we, we want this to be resolved immediately, to be over and to be done. And then we don't understand why we aren't forgiven already. We don't get that. Now what happens is when we work through these four steps, and you can probably think of a conversation or relationship that you've had this week, maybe even this morning on your way to church, where you worked through these four steps with somebody that's close to you, family member, friend, whoever, and you're sitting in a position now where you don't understand why things aren't forgiven already. And, and I, can, I can explain that to you. See, explaining when, when we've hurt somebody, we've hurt them. You've hurt them. They are hurt by you and by your words. So then when you go through these steps here, what you're saying to them is now, hey, I've hurt you, but now I need you to trust me. I need you to accept what I'm saying I need you to get over what I said to you. I need you to forgive me already. I need you to immediately forgive me. I need you to to trust that I didn't say it on purpose. I need you to be open and let all of my explanations as to why I hurt you be considered truth. And I need you to just stop feeling hurt the way that you feel. This is the way this comes across. Now, I know that there are some... um, you know, exceptions to this. Sometimes it is good to explain, you know, something that you said or, or why you said it. But I'm talking about in general. This is why when we take time to try and explain the hurt away, this is why it doesn't actually repair. And in fact, instead of repairing, explaining can often feel just like blaming. Because then what happens here from this is that we end up kind of taking people to a place of... Um, uh, uh, I don't understand why you haven't forgiven me yet. So what's wrong with you? See, I've played my part. I, I did mine. And, and I, I promise you, if the, I don't know how many people in, are in this room, but probably 50 to 70% of you in this room are sitting in this exact moment in a relationship right now where you're saying, I've done my part. Now it's time for you to do your part. I, yes, I said something. I hurt you. But I apologize for it. I explained it. I justified it. And I don't understand why you haven't forgiven me. So I've done my part. Now you 
need to do your part. And where that leads us to is almost to, like I said, to this blame. It's us saying, like, it's, now it's on you. I'm now blaming you because you've not forgiven me. See, explaining why we hurt somebody, it doesn't repair. Explaining oftentimes leads to, to deeper hurt. It, it leads to us playing the blame game. Or it leads to the person that you've hurt feeling like now they're to blame So now they're saying things to themselves like, I don't understand why I can't just forgive you. I don't understand why I can't just forgive them. I don't understand why I can't just let go of this. I don't understand why I can't get over it, why I can't heal, why I can't move on. Because this person that's hurt me, they've apologized and they've moved on. And their life looks wonderful and they're happy and they're ready to go. But I still feel like a reconciled. So what's wrong with me? Now, I'm the one that's ostracized from the relationship. I'm the one that's an outsider. I'm the one that can't get over this. What's wrong with me? And now they've taken on the blame. You know, I, I, I don't want our relationships to, to stay this way. You know, I know that you're in a relationship that's like this. And what I hope for is is that we have less and less and less of these things. And a lot of what we're talking about today is is like is social engineering. It's how do we actually share this planet and this world with each other? You know, and where it ties into like our our Christianity and, and, and what it means to be a Christ follower is you know, God tells us that the the greatest commandment that we can follow is to love God and then to love others. Now, when we go about loving others, that means that we love others in our conversations, in our arguments, in our disagreements. It means you love your wife or your husband. It means you love your older brother or younger brother or sister. It means you love your coworker. It means you love the taxi driver. It means that you love our president. It means that you love all those people that have hurt you in your life. It means that you love all the people that you're hurting and you don't understand why they can't get over it and forgive you. But if we're going to be a people, as Christ's followers, that follow that commandment, love God and love others, we need to understand some of these truths. That when we try and explain hurt away, it ends up blaming people. Or we end up placing the blame on others. And so you think, okay, well what if I just say uh, sorry to this? Because sorry is a very good word, it's a healing word. And so to kind of talk about apologies, so instead of explaining something, let me just apologize for it. And I'll I'll say, I'll give you a shortcut to the end of the message. The apology is the right thing to do. But we need to understand a couple things about our apology. So let me bring you up to speed on this here. You've said something to somebody and you've hurt them. They feel some kind of hurt in their relationship with you. You've now taken time, you've tried to justify it, you've tried to explain it away, you've got expectations that they forgive you, they don't forgive you, you're, you're trying to understand why they can't just forgive you, and maybe there's been some blame associated, and they feel a little bit of blame, you know, they're taking on blame on themselves. So now we're at a point where you think, okay, I'm open to trying to heal this thing, you know, Pastor Chris is up there teaching us this stuff, okay, he says, apologize, let me apologize for what I've done. But we need to understand that when we apologize, it doesn't mean everything is just healed and ready and back to normal. Because apologies don't, don't do that. If I take it, okay, let me explain to you again in the physical. Because it's really easy to understand physically before it is to understand spiritually or to understand emotionally. So um, let's just say, for example, okay, I, I'll tell you another story about myself here. Um, or actually, I want to tell you a different story. I, I remember growing up, uh, I do make up some of this on the spot, but I do remember growing up, I was, at, I was at my grandmother's house. This is not a story I meant to tell, but it's the picture that I have in my mind. I was at my grandmother's house, and we, it's actually my great-grandmother, and we were in her yard. It's a huge, huge, huge garden. Um, and so we were in there, and I remember it was, it was probably about uh, uh, like uh, 4th of July, which is our summer, it's our Independence Day. And I was watching my brother and my younger cousin uh, fight each other with sticks, and, which was normal for us to do at the time. So my little brother, five years younger than me, he had a big stick. And then my cousin, uh, maybe two years younger than him, had a big stick. And they were, you know, like sword fighting with it. And then I remember my, my cousin Bryson seeing him 
you know, swing at my brother Patrick, and he hit him like in the in the gum, like under the under the lip, and just like sliced it open. And so Patrick ended up having to have uh, lots of stitches. See, my brother and I, when I fell, I bounced. When he fell, he broke. So he <laughs> he is an extremely tough tough guy. He's tough. He's strong. He's he's great. He's a he's wonderful. But he's the one with all the broken bones. When he got hit in the face with a stick, his lip busted open. He needed stitches for that. And when my cousin Bryson said, hey, you know, I'm sorry for that. You know, I apologize for that. He was mortified that he had done this. See, here's what we can learn from from the apology. See, the apology, it it didn't reverse what, what happened. So apologies don't reverse or erase accidental injury to the body. Just because Bryson said, hey, I'm so sorry that I hit you with a stick and now you've got to have stitches. It, it, it doesn't erase that. It doesn't take it away. Oh, I remember the story I was going to... Do you want to hear the story? You guys want to hear the story? I, I was out of college. This is crazy. I was out of college and um, we were on my boss's property. It was working for a construction company. We had these, these four by fours, these four wheelers. I've not seen them here, but... They make these four by fours that have these roll cages on them, and uh, you know they can drive in the mud. You guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah, they're they're amazing. And so naturally, me and a friend were doing donuts in one, and I was driving, and we were just just you know slinging dirt, and kind of had gotten past that stage of you know thinking, and now we were just maniacally doing donuts, you know, in the dirt. And the one of the tires caught a rock, and that thing rolled. And of course, we're not wearing seat belts because. We'd have to slow down to put a seatbelt on. We just got in and started doing donuts. It was the first time I figured out when you push the gas pedal down and jerk the wheel on the rear end. I mean, it was like, it was amazing. So anyway, we rolled this thing two or three times. Now, my friend sitting in the passenger seat, he did the, the unsmart thing. So I, I tucked. I just became a bowling ball and I fell out the top and rolled away from it. But he put his foot out because I guess he thought, I'm going to stop this, you know, Molt this one ton piece of equipment with my foot and everything's just going to be right and it, it didn't work that way the roll cage went across his calf muscle and have you guys ever stepped on a grape <laughs> yeah that's a good picture there you know your son somebody drops a grape you're in the store you step on it and it's like just pops you know, that's essentially what happened with his calf muscles. So as we're driving to the emergency room and he's in the back of the car and we're cutting his jeans and there's, you know, like fat and stuff stuck to the inside of the jeans. I remember saying to his wife, Sam, I'm so sorry. Sam, I'm really, really sorry. Brian, I'm so sorry. Brian, you know, please forgive me. It, it doesn't erase the fact that it, this injury is still there. It's still there. In the same way that, that this impacts us physically, in the same way that, it, that it's meaningful in a physical way, it's the same when it comes to our heart and soul. So we could change body and we could say apologies don't reverse and erase accidental injury to the heart and soul. No matter how difficult or how light or how heavy the accident is, when we say that we're sorry, it doesn't erase that injury that happened. So yes, it is good to apologize, but that doesn't mean that when I say I'm sorry today, when I leave church and I go to that person and I say, hey, I apologize, we cannot have the expectation that it's just going to make all the hurt and all the pain go away. Now, it may happen. It, it, healing may just automatically come. And if that happens, then amazing. But more times than not, it doesn't happen that way. And oftentimes when we don't get that reaction... Then we take our apology and we start to add an, an explanation to it. Hey, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do this. I didn't mean to hurt you. No reaction that comes. Okay, but let me explain. Remember, it wasn't on purpose. It was an accident. I'm really sorry that that happened. And so then what happens is when we take an apology and we combine an apology with an explanation, then that ends up sounding like an excuse. Put that on the screen for us there. I want you to let this soak in here. Because we oftentimes don't stop at apology. We take an apology. We combine it with an explanation. And then that comes across as an excuse. It almost invalidates your apology. Say, so, hey, I'm really sorry about this. But here's why this happened. And the person receiving that apology is like, man, they, they just didn't get it. You know? 
They just, they just didn't get it. Have you ever heard somebody apologize you know, to you this way? Hey, I'm, I'm so sorry that you're overly sensitive and emotional. You know, I'm so sorry that we had that, you know, if I, you know, that we had the other day. But, but you're, you're like, you know, you're pretty emotional, kind of unstable. So please accept my apology. And also I accept your apology for being, you know, a, an, unemotion, or an unstable person emotionally. That, that's not a great apology. That's more of like an excuse. And then, then that brings me to what, what oftentimes comes after that. And, and, and that's this idea of, of like word damage. And, and as I was thinking about word damage, I was actually, again, thinking about comparing it to something physical. See, when, when I accidentally broke the window, it was easy for my mom to see that it really was an accident. It wasn't smart. It wasn't me being smart. Why was I kicking the ball against the smallest portion of the wall that was surrounded on both sides by windows? Not smart. But she could see and trust that it really was an accident. I wasn't just teeing off trying to knock all the windows out. So I said, Mom, I'm sorry. That was an accident. Okay, I understand it's an accident. Go wait for your father in, in, in your room. And that, you know, that's the punishment is waiting on the impending doom. And then when Dad comes home, nothing happens. And it's like, oh, my life is spared. But when we get out of the physical world and we get into what, what, I, what I call word damage... See, when you've hurt somebody, it always impacts trust. So it's really hard when I say something, I hurt somebody, and I try and explain it away, or I give an apology with a condition, and I say, hey, it's an accident. It's hard for the person on the other side of that. And we need to understand this, because there's somebody on the other side of your explanation. It's hard for them to trust that it really was an accident. And, and I mean, th- this is me in relationships. And oftentimes I can find myself thinking, yeah, but you said it. And because you said it, it means it's in there. And because it's in there, it's in there for a reason. It's in there because you have thought it. There's always truth in jest. It's in there because it's a part of your thought pattern about me. Just because you say sorry, I don't know that it's no longer in there anymore. And in fact, now I'm left thinking and, and believing and wondering about that, you know, this idea of, like, okay, you know what? I'm not convinced that I didn't just learn something about the way you view and value me. So it's really hard to restore that trust. It's really hard when that trust is broken. Because the person on the other side of your explanation, it's hard for them to trust that, you know what? It really was an accident. I really can't accept their apology because that trust is impacted. So these are all things that we just need to understand. Right now, what I've done up to this point, and I'm about to read a Bible verse to you and then we're going to close up. But what I've done up to this point is giving you good advice. This is good, tested, tried and true advice. It stands up Culturally, it stands up. Socially, it stands up across all kinds of relationships all over the world. It it stands up everywhere. This is good advice. But where does this good advice come from? This good advice comes from, you know, I believe the way that Jesus modeled that we should treat each other, that we should love each other. And then there's a guy in the Bible, James, who who kind of brings even more meaning to our tongue and and to our words. And and that's the scripture that we're going to look at here. And in James chapter 3, 2... It it says this, indeed, we all, so that's we all, make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, so if you could control what you say or you don't say, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. Meaning that the tongue is the hardest thing to control. So that means that you are going to hurt someone's feelings. You are going to say something wrong. You are accidentally going to call somebody something you didn't mean to call them. It's going to happen. Because the tongue is the hardest part of us to control. Our words are the hardest thing for us to control. And then he goes on in in, in verse 5 and he says, In the same way, the tongue, it's a small thing and it makes grand speeches. It's the smallest part of your body that has the greatest impact. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. So James is saying, all it takes, that tiny spark is one word. It's you saying one word, one thought. One idea, and that spark is, is lit. And that lit spark can then turn into 
of fire. And then James goes on in, in verse 6 and he says, Among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. So I'm reading this to you guys because I, I, I don't just want to talk at you. I want to talk to you and I want you to receive these words. I just want you to understand or be aware of or be inspired to think that the things that I say matter. That there is weight to my words. That I am a source of of words to somebody that listens to me. And all that stuff comes from my tongue. My tongue physically causes words to happen, but, but my tongue also represents something that's in my heart because what's in here flows out of here. And it's really hard to control this here. And so James goes on to say, it's a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. See, what you say, it has that big of an impact. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. See, what James is trying to get us to understand is the severity of what we say and the impact that it has. The things that you say that come out of your mouth can build life or it can tear life down. It can heal the broken relationship you currently have, or it can make it even worse and dig an even deeper trench. So if we've got a fire in our life, if you've said something, your words have sparked a fire, and now there's a huge bush fire that's burning, what is the fire that's burning in your life? Is it a failed marriage, a broken marriage? Is that fire a broken relationship? So much of this has to do with, with people on people, relationship on relationship. Where have you said something that's created or sparked a fire that's now burning down somebody's hope?